Well, that was an interesting conversation with Christina Salnestrelli from the Affordable Art Fair. And don't forget, stay tuned because we have Dr. Neil Flock. He's going to talk about diabetes, which is a subject near and dear to me since I'm a type 2 diabetic. We're also going to have Steve Cuzo from the New York Post on, who is a type 2 diabetic. He writes about real estate and restaurants, since we all have to eat and we all need a place to live. And people who are going to help us afford those places to live, and nobody is better at that than Melissa Cohn from MC Home Loans, who is my frequent guest and friend. And Melissa can get anybody a mortgage. If she can get me one, she can help you. Welcome, Melissa. Thanks so much, Rob. What a great introduction. Well, you're the best. Even another mortgage broker unnamed from another company was like, Melissa, is, how can you get any better? She's a legend, is how he referred to you. That uh, makes me feel like I'm really old. You're not not old at all. You're very Thanks. young. Uh, just kidding. Far younger than I. Uh, so you and I were just speaking briefly in the green room while our producer, Tony, was serving everybody uh, shrimp cocktail, caviar, I forgot what else goes in the rider on my contract. I, I have to have some specific foods. Uh, well, champagne, but, of course. And, and the champagne. Uh, but on a serious note, we are talking just about volatility of markets, and we are talking about things that affect not just global markets, but domestic markets. Uh, and we, just to be clear, too, with our listeners, we record the show on Wednesday. We air on Sundays because sometimes people mention Wednesday. So yesterday we dealt, which was Tuesday, uh, with terror in Brussels. Uh, the last time it happened in France a number of months ago, uh, it, it really shook the stock market dramatically. I didn't see that as much. And I'm also wondering, I was asking Melissa previously, how does this affect real estate and how does it affect mortgage rates and, and what happens and what can we expect? Well, you know, that's a really interesting question. When the Paris attacks happened, I think the markets were uh, somewhat more unprepared for that to happen and stocks tumbled and bond yields went down, which helped mortgage rates go down. Um, just for the fear of what this terrorism will do to the economies and this, you know, a fear. It's basically the fear factor. When the Brussels attacks happened yesterday, uh, the markets, you know, early in the morning before we came to work were were down and, and bond yields were way down and, and stocks were down. But uh it seems that the markets were better able to contain the quote unquote the you know terror factor and by the end of the day our markets and even Europe's markets were really recovered from what had happened and have essentially taken it into stride um but there are a couple of things that you have to take into consideration when you think about that and one is what is the cost of dealing with terrorism to our economies you know and will that cost affect our economy and, you know, with the additional expense and, and what does that do to the rest of the market? You know, our market here, we've been recovering ever so slowly from the Great Recession and we've seen some good signs of life in the economy over the course of the past few months. Um, and especially, for example, we just got the new home sales report showing that new home sales grew uh, by 2% this past month, you know, showing that real estate has really been the leader in our economic recovery. Um, and the question becomes, if a fear factor settles into the market, will people be concerned about buying and waiting to see if that next shoe is going to drop before they're willing to make a decision? Interestingly enough, today's market while, yes, everyone is still contemplating what has happened in Brussels, seems to be um, still fairly stable. Um, and I take that as good news for the real estate market and good news, obviously, for the economy. Is data, or is it data, is that our friend in this regard? Because it can guide us and we can see exactly on a daily basis how things are changing so that there's less panic? Um. Absolutely. I think that the most important thing is to go back to the fundamentals of the economy and looking at uh, jobless claims, looking at inflation reports, manufacturing, job gains, and really determining where our economy is actually going. Um, 
for mortgage rates, uh, bad news for the economy is good news for rates. Good news for the economy is bad news for rates because as any sign of growth in the economy, that generally signals growth in inflation and that pushes bond yields back up. We were also talking just prior to this with Rebecca Mason from Stribling and Associates about the rental market and how that's affecting sales. Um, any any thoughts on that? Um, you know, New York is a very unique city in the sense that we have all different levels of uh, prices of properties and and people in many dis- different industries with different you know levels of you know income. And I think that we're find, finding that the uh, markets are really being determined by, for example, the price of houses has gone up by 6% over the course of the past year. So some people are being priced out of it and being forced to go back into the rental market. Um, as interest rates come down, even though prices are up, you know, mortgages are cheaper. You can borrow more than you could have if the rate was a half a percent higher. Um, and that that turns people back into the purchase market. Well, that, that's um, real. I, that's a really interesting number for me because I'm not a numbers person. So I love listening to someone like yourself give me this kind of information. A, a half a percentage point can be demonstrative, then. Absolutely, especially if you're looking at a million dollar mortgage. If you're looking to borrow two, three, four hundred thousand dollars, the half a percentage is not going to be as meaningful in terms of looking at the real dollars. But if you take into consideration who that buyer is and their socioeconomic profile, that, you know, that half a percent means a lot to everyone. So is that, what's the first thing you're going to look at then when you're talking to somebody about what they're purchasing? Does it depend on their budget? What, what, what do you take into consideration immediately to, to crunch well, your numbers? Being a numbers person, the first thing that I do is I look at their income and their assets and, and try to give them a ballpark of how much they could afford to buy for, meaning if someone has $200,000 and sufficient income, they may be bound by how much cash they have for a down payment and for closing costs. Um, you know, the opposite can be true for someone with you know lesser income but you know a lot more capital. So it's my job to help, you know, create that box for them and then talk about what they're looking for. Are they looking to buy a condo? Are they looking to buy a co-op? Do they have any sense of what the monthly carrying charges will be on the units, the properties that they're looking at? I I had one client, for example, two weeks ago that I did an exercise with. He had X dollars to spend. He wanted a monthly budget of, I believe it's $5,000 a month. And he showed me three different apartments that all had different levels of carrying costs. So I did an exercise for him where I said, on a five-year adjustable rate, you could borrow this much to keep your budget at the 5000 versus a 30-year fix where the interest rates are higher and therefore you could borrow less. So I sort of I created a spreadsheet of, of his affordability you know, through the different apartments. And I think that that's a really important exercise for people to make. I Yeah, I really like that kind of stuff because I think we're all enticed too much. Whenever you go online now, there's always some some little pop-up thing that goes, mortgage calculator, you can afford this, just type this stuff in. But we're not taking into consideration the other consequences that come along with that. Right, like you have to look at a building. You know, Has the maintenance not increased for five years? What is the likelihood that that will go up in the next year or two? Probably pretty great. If you look at a building where the carrying costs went up last year, then you can be assured that they should be fairly stable for the next two or three years. So you have to take not just your income and your cash into consideration. You have to look at the property that you're buying and, and how the other variables can affect your cash flow. Do you look at stuff at, at, at different buildings like how much is in a reserve fund? Absolutely. Um, and remember, and we've talked about this before, that – Getting your buyer approved is probably sometimes easier than getting the building that you're looking into approved because, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have guidelines about how much uh, cash buildings have to have in reserve, generally 10% of their operating budget. How much uh, are they running at a positive or are they running at a loss? 
a lot of buildings try to really run at a break even. So if there's an unusual expense from one year to the next, it could mean that there was a loss or perhaps a bigger gain. Um, and banks want to look at the stability of the financials in the building and also the owner occupancy. Yeah, when I was a board president, I was always hung up with the amount of money in our reserve fund, and a lot of people disagreed with me that lived in the building. We ended up having to do a couple of massive assessments, and then owners really went ballistic. So I I think that that's another factor that people are unaware about, especially first-time buyers. They don't even know what a reserve fund is or how a building runs. Right, but you have to remember, and and I, I agree with the other people in your building, that one, yes, it's great to have the comfort of a big reserve fund, but that means that you as a current owner have contributed to that. And if you're going to be selling the property, it means that you put money into a building where you may not actually see the benefits of that contribution. True. I guess it depends on how transient the building is. And then some buildings still have flip taxes, which can be effective in, in that regard as well. So Absolutely. I mean, you know, buildings have different ways that they uh, earn their income, be it from uh, – flip taxes or even little things like a move-in ta- a fee. You know, every every penny counts, and the more that they can get from outside sources other than just the monthly maintenance, you know, the better it is for the owners. And then generally, the better the value of that property. Yeah, I should add that so I don't sound like an incompetent. I did live in a specific kind of building where there was very little turnover, and there were large fa- – we're not even allowed to say this because of the Department of State, but there were large apartments where many people lived – in one one unit, you're not supposed to say family, uh, and large so, family, large. It, it there were, they could could hold a number of people, and th- so we they turned over very seldom, and I think that was a factor. So people stayed for the long haul. But it, if it's a different kind of building and it's going to be comprised of a lot of one bedroom apartments, and there obviously is going to be more of a turnover. So I think it depends too on how you run the building. That's what's unique about New York City. Uh, Melissa, as usual, always helpful and educational, and I look forward to having you on again soon. Thanks Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Rob. Great talking to you. Always. Bye.